So this is probably the first video I ever made that I actually liked the editing job. It's definitely the first of these old world building videos that I haven't cringed the whole way through the rewatch. So this one time, I'll encourage you not to skip forward to the new content. But if you insist, here it is. Welcome world builders, sewers, and costume enthusiasts. And if you happen to be all three, you're awesome. A while ago, I made a series about how to create a system of clothing for a fantasy race, a topic which I am borderline obsessed with and one that doesn't get enough love. I put my idea of a system into practice with one of my fantasy races, the Nauticans, and I got a few comments along the lines of, oh, I see you so, you should make this. And I was like, ha ha, right, I'll just whip that up. But then I started looking through my fabric stash. Yes, I'm doing it. And here we are. The best thing about this project is that world builders rarely have the opportunity to see how their ideas might play out in real life. So I'm excited to share this process with you, experimenting and trying to bring my drawings to life, but also getting to see where I can improve my art by learning what is actually functional and what isn't. The goal of this project isn't to make a single costume, but to determine how well the system of clothing works as a whole. So this will require making a variety of pieces. The most important place to start, I think, are the pants. I was drawing them based off of a rudimentary idea of how they might be put together and function, but I won't know if I was right until I make a pair. The idea is that they are made of one rectangle, sewn into a tube with an opening in the center for the waist. If you've never made a pair of pants, the pattern shapes are funky. Lots of curves, lots of wasted fabric. Even harem pants, which I was originally basing the style on, waste a lot of fabric. So I went to try and invent a completely different way to make pants using only straight rectangles. draping pattern that I predicted. The only problem is that it's so wide that it actually kind of folds and makes this triangle shape. Also, it does not hang down as far as I predicted. It is absolutely not movement restricting at all. It does kind of do the bubble butt thing, but you know, if I was going for the most flattering, I would go with fantasy medieval. Because all of the excess is pulled towards the front, it kind of swoops over and around my hips. So it's kind of an interesting, unique shape that I've never seen before anywhere else. I'm not sure how this whole hip thing would work on a man, because men don't have as much of a shelf for this to rest on, but overall these are pretty much functional how I was planning, especially the freedom of movement thing. We know the upper and lower limit of this. Okay, so what I did is I took my remaining strip of this blue fabric, which was a few inches wider, and I made the pants again. This is much, much better. I sewed this seam into a casing and threaded it. And then I sewed on a little gold button, just like in the pictures. Then also I can untie those and they just fall down. So that gives you a little bit more size flexibility. This whole way it kind of curves up and drapes, it's just not very practical. I just can't see it staying up very well in a real life born situation. But other than that, this pair is pretty good.
I have three pants. I added the gussets and waistband to the blue pants, and I made a new pair of gold pants in the new dimensions from a thinner gold fabric with a much better drape. Hey, coming at you from the future. There were a couple of things we learned from wearing the pants. To tie down the pants, I had to raise the buttons to just below the knee. The cords were held up by tying around the button first. It worked well enough for me to consider the idea valid, but I think it still needs more work in the future. I didn't have time to make any child size pants, but we actually made it work anyways by gathering the legs up and pinning a couple of more pleats into the back. They still didn't stay up well because of the aforementioned hip problem, but we found a new design element that did the job. Suspenders. Narrow strips of fabric pinned to the waistband and slung over one shoulder or both, then hidden beneath the wrapped top. So now we know how men and children keep their pants up, and it's onto the tops. Okay, so I made a pair of sleeves, and I'm really not sure how I'm going to attach them. I have kind of a working idea, but I have no idea if it's actually going to function the way I am trying to make it function in my head. New design element. Now there are buttons at the shoulders, and the length of the sleeve is determined by which loop you thread through the button. And with that, I'm going to call these sleeves done, which makes for exactly one piece of this project that has gone better than expected. With the leftover misty blue fabric, I cut out one large circle, which I envision being a special, versatile piece. But more on that some other time. I stitched up the remainder into another wrap. Okay, so I put two more pieces together today. I used the blue wave print quilting cotton and I made the skirt. All I did was turn it into one big tube and then I shifted all of the pleats towards the front and I put in two darts for the hips. The skirt's actually, I'm pretty happy with. Okay, the squishy moccasins. I think the idea came from this pair, which I made several years ago. For leather, I don't want to waste the actual moccasin leather I've been saving, and there are limits as to how much my dad will let me steal from his shop, so instead I bought a very thin, stretchy faux suede from Joann's. Well, that was easy. We have got to get this project done, so I have the lovely Ava here helping me. Hello. She's also going to model. 
We have this awesome fish belt, five bucks on eBay. We have a couple of different hair pieces we're setting together. We have this pennant, which has turned out amazing. I also found this perfect chain necklace. However, I am struggling to make the bra tops in a way that'll actually provide some support. I don't think the idea is trash, but I do think it needs more careful consideration. For the purposes of this project, we'll just make do. Though I did manage to make this one look pretty good by building it onto a pre-existing strapless bra. Okay, so today we filmed. This is the kind of project that I could have tweaked and redone endlessly, but this was the last warm day on the radar and we just kind of had to get it done. It was really bugging me that the one pair of pants I've used most often in my illustrations was the one pair I didn't have. So I made them this morning in like three hours and they are probably the fastest, crappiest painting and sewing job I have ever done. And this is it. I wound up with, well, a lot more pieces than I probably needed, more than we even had time to film. I feel like I just made a mermaid's trousseau, but I do have some cool ideas that I can use them for in the future. And I really want to thank you if you've made it this far into my weird esoteric video. <laughs> but that's what makes world building fun, the vast realms of personal interest you can involve. All right, gotta go. So the premise of this video was really simple. I'd been drawing all of this clothing based solely on my theories of how shapes and patterns work in drape as fabric. I wanted to test it out, and I found that my original designs weren't that far off, but a few additions really brought it all to life. There isn't really anything that I see to critique in this video, however one main addition I made later on is a type of gathered bra to attach the necklaces to. This did the job of support, but it also filled a function that I hadn't anticipated. I found wrapping and pinning the tops a little bit challenging because the folds would shift around and sink down over time. Having a bodice beneath gave me something to pin into and made the wraps much more practical and realistic. So for this video, I want to go through comments and answer questions and flesh out the nautikins just a tiny bit more before I close their chapter for a while. I have only a few videos left before I move on to new content, and when I do, I want to focus on avians and the other mainlander cultures and, like, the general history of the world. <laughs> I pulled comments only from the previous video. There were a lot, but I noticed trends of the same type of comment or general idea getting repeated three to five times, which is sort of a cool evolution of this channel to see, because it's now getting to the point where the audience is aggregating good logical ideas. So I grouped and categorized the types of comments I got, and we'll just go through them now. First, there were several comments about the original island ethnicities. This one is basically pointing out that such distinct ethnic grouping is unlikely in a crowded environment and happens more when there are geographical barriers preventing cross-pollination. However, it might work if there was a strict caste system keeping people apart. We'll come back to this one. The next is saying that the ethnic grouping would make more sense if it started out as grouping based on job specialization. This one is asking about breakish waters where rivers deposit into salt water and you get a mixture. There were also people in the previous video asking about saltwater versus freshwater gills and pointing out that fish can't simply switch that easily in real life. Fair enough, I didn't major in biology. I'm perfectly willing to ignore some science in favor of world building and just fill in the gap with magic, but sometimes if you can work in the silence, it makes for just optimal world building. 
This comment was asking about their blood, if they have purple blood like marine life, or if they still have red human blood. And finally, this comment was pointing out that it's a bit weird for only one group to have two-toned skin, which, yeah. Okay, you got all that? There's a lot to keep straight, but I think we can work it all in together. Right then, remember in the last video when I said that all Nautican started out extremely pale, but there were subtle blue or yellow undertones in their skin? What if the undertones weren't a simple color difference, but actually signified a difference in their genetics and adaptability? What if the blue undertones came from purple marine blood, which was paired with gills and a breathing system that was much better suited for salt water? The yellow undertones came from more human red blood and gills that adapted better to fresh water, such as the rivers on the island. Maybe in the early days on the island, before it became overcrowded, the blue and yellow nauticans lived mostly together, but they divided off during the day for their work. Maybe those who could handle salt water better did most of the farming and fishing in the ocean. And I say handle it better because that's where I'm willing to add some magical flexibility. It wouldn't work well for my stories if yellow nauticans shriveled up and died as soon as they hit the ocean. But if they find salt water disgusting and nauseating to breathe, I think that will be an acceptable hindrance. Those who couldn't handle salt water well preferred to stay on shore, so they took on more of the craftsmen, tradesmen work. In this way, the divide between blue and yellow would begin, because spending their days in such drastically different environments would quickly lead to two separate cultural identities forming. Yellows and blues would spend more time with their own subculture and would be more likely to marry within it, furthering the divide. And this is a generalization. Obviously, there will always be non-conformist individuals, but we are focusing on the general populace. Also, as both blue and yellow spent more time on land, their skin tones would begin to darken a bit, and the blue and yellow undertones would become more distinct. And then time passed and the island filled. This is when selfish elements would come into play. As the land ran out, the yellow nauticans began to panic. They wanted the land and rivers, and from their point of view, they had the greater claim to it because they needed it more. They became power hungry, wanting control so that they could ensure a place for themselves and their families. They accelerated the blue and yellow divide and encouraged, then later enforced, a caste system that would prioritize yellow nauticans having access to land and shifting the blue nauticans to underwater housing. Eventually, even the yellow nauticans ran out of room on the island, and many were sent to sea. Those nauticans gathered in the tide zone, around the river basins, and in the breakish waters. They eventually developed a greater tolerance to both salt and fresh water, but it took countless generations. So, as discussed in the previous video, the yellow nauticans who lived above the water at the highest cast developed tan skin. The blue nauticans who were shafted to the lowest cast developed a strong two-tone in their skin. And the blue and yellow nauticans who shared the tide zones were somewhere in between. Say they had a faint two-toning, which the yellow nauticans would find particularly unattractive as it marked their lower status. Obviously, these categories are much too restrictive. In reality, I think the tide zone would be very diverse, as there were parts that would only see an hour or two of sun a day, and other parts that were only submerged for a short time each day but I don't have the time or inclination to illustrate every possible variation. This works well enough to get the point across. I really like this update. I know I've told basically the same timeline several times now, but I think it gets better and deeper and more interesting each time. It also explains another part of why not many of the original upper-class nauticans made it to the mainland. Not only did they suffer the most casualties in the apocalypse, but the journey through saltwater was also the most difficult for them, as opposed to the yellow nauticans of the tide zone who had developed a better salinity tolerance. Then, modern nauticans might still have a hint of that two-tone skin coloration, but only very faintly. Okay, next. There were several comments along the same lines, basically linking the amount of time a nautican child spends breathing the air to the age at which they metamorphosize. I like it, it makes sense, and it also makes sense with the eventual class divide. It makes me think of history when rural kids had to stay home and help on the farm, and wealthy kids were able to go to school. Maybe the blue nauticans' metamorphosis came later and later because they spent so much time working under the water that it was a better adaption for them to retain their fins until their late teens. But the Yellow Island nauticans shed their tails earlier and earlier because for them being able to walk around on land was the better advantage. These two comments were talking about polygamy and arranged marriages. I agree, arranged marriages would definitely be prevalent, especially among wealthy families who need to maintain connections between other powerful families in order to preserve their status. This comment is also talking about how with arranged marriages, you get a lot of formal marriages and then personal love lives. I think that would definitely happen, again, especially in the upper classes. And then this comment is also talking about how you might get multifamily units. I absolutely agree, but I don't think it would be random or like friends. I think it would be multiple generations of the same family sharing housing and resources. I think that makes the most sense if one of their chief drives is to ensure the success of their family line. Connected to that one, there were a few comments asking about breastfeeding, especially with so many children at once. I think this could actually be worked to support some kind of matrilineal family grouping. Maybe female relatives prefer to stay in the same household as they trust their children with nobody 
so much as their blood sisters, and the brothers are expected to go live with their respective mates. Maybe there is a family link, where sisters living together will all begin to lactate if one becomes pregnant, and they all support each other when it's their turn to bear children. However, this would all depend on careful family planning to ensure the sisters don't all get pregnant at the same time, further supporting the arranged marriages theory. Okay, a few more questions on nautican biology. This comment is talking about how deafness would probably not be even a disability underwater. I mean, yeah. <laughs> also, maybe that when Nauticans go to the mainland, they're the ones to introduce sign language to the mainlanders. I like that too. I've always thought the idea of a simple but universal sign language to get around language barriers would be cool. This one is sort of related. Underwater, in addition to being less reliant on hearing, blue Nauticans would also be less reliant on smell. They might almost entirely lose their sense of smell, but they might instead have a heightened sense of taste, which is related to smell. So maybe they wouldn't completely lose their sense of smell, but maybe they experience smell very differently. This one is asking about doubled eyelids like frogs. Someone on Instagram had mentioned alligator eyelids and I meant to add it in the last video. I forgot, but I actually think frog eyelids would be better because Nauticans have some very frog-like traits already, so maybe they're shared DNA somewhere alongside the human and fish DNA. Maybe like that amphibian element is what makes the human and fish work. This one says, if they're born from eggs, why do they have belly buttons? Uh, because I drew them without belly buttons and it just looked too weird so I drew belly buttons. You're right, they shouldn't have them. <laughs> this comment was asking about webbed fingers. There was a decent discussion beneath it about whether webbed fingers would help or hinder the nauticans in swimming versus using tools and signing to each other. I came down on the side that webbed fingers would probably cause more problems than they'd help, so evolution would not favor them. However, maybe the babies and those still with tails have webbed fingers, even if it's just minimal. Maybe they lose the webbing when they metamorphosize, except maybe the deep blue nauticans have evolved to keep a bit of the webbing. Okay, two more categories. First, mermaids. I got a bunch of comments talking about selkies. I did read a story about selkies when I was a kid, but I forgot about it until those comments. So now I'm leaning towards the mermaids having the ability to grow legs and come on shore in pairing with their previously discussed asexual reproduction. It's grimy, but here's why. I've mentioned that all of the races are created and also that the Nauticans were an early attempt at mermaids. So it does make sense for the perfected version, the mermaids, to have some sort of control over their metamorphosis and be capable of shifting between forms. While the Nauticans are sort of stuck as one until they become the other, with no control. But more than that, they were created. Think about it. They were an attempt to bring the classic sailor's fantasy to life, so it makes sense for the god who made them to make an all-female mermaid species that is biologically driven to grow legs and come on shore looking for men. But it also is really satisfying in a just dessert sense. The god tried to create a male sex fantasy, but ended up with these savage women who literally prey upon men. It's grimy and I probably won't use it in a story because it's not the kind of story I want to write, but the idea just fits so well and it's dripping with karma. And then finally, the LGBT question, which I've gotten approximately one million times. Hey there, re-recording this section. Basically, I'm not really trying to write an LGBT acceptance wish fulfillment fantasy, but neither do I want to write an oppression fantasy. I get the place for them, and I understand why people are drawn to reading and writing such stories, but I feel like my bent is a bit more speculative here. And if we're honestly speculating, given the factors in the history I've set up, I don't exactly think it's a recipe for a highly tolerant society. However, we're also dealing with a several thousand year timeline, branching into multiple factions, with cultural shifts and high points and low points, so I don't feel like things would be all bad all the time, but I think it would really depend on when and where a person lived, whether the society was pushing population growth or wanting to level the population off, and also the level of prosperity versus need. So feel free to speculate yourself. I don't feel like I've given it enough thought to hammer down specifics, so I'd rather leave it open for now. Alright, and with that, we are done with the Nauticans for a bit. There are only four videos left in the old stack. Next is the corsetry video, which I might just re-upload as is, or I might delete it. I don't know. I don't particularly love or hate it, but it is world building directed enough that I want it down from my main channel. Then there was the one on death rituals, then the original avian video, then the second little avian video. The last videos are all newer, and I have less updating to do with them. And then new stuff! I will be focusing heavily on avians for a while, and starting work on the mainlanders, and then getting into a bit of the history of the world. So, see you next time.